We are studying the book of Philippians, if you're visiting with us. We're almost done with the book. We're, we've come to the end, and we have found that the book of Philippians is a very blessed book. We've been talking in chapter 4 about spiritual stability, being spiritually strong. And if we cultivate that, as we've been talking about, standing strong, striving for harmony in the church, constantly having a joyful attitude, graciousness with everyone, always praying with thankful hearts ahead of time, trusting in what God's will is for our life. And we experience God's peace, His real presence. And last week we saw, we also, we think positive. We're not, we don't get caught up in the negativity of the world. We think about the positive things of God. If we cultivate all that, then we'll be able to say what Paul says here in these four verses we're going to look at. Talking about contentment. Let's read it together. Philippians 4, 10-13. He says, I've, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. That's a great verse to memorize right there. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. You know, I guess if we wanted to pick a theme song, for our part of the world, it would be the Rolling Stones. Satisfaction. That is, I can't get no satisfaction. I try and I try and I try, and that seems to be what our culture is about. And if you think about it, every ad on TV is designed to make you feel unsatisfied not content. Somebody's got more than you got. Somebody's got a better husband than you got that buys you that bigger diamond or buys you that car for Christmas. And on and on and on it goes. Even our kids get caught up in it. And, and, they're, and they're, they're not able to be content. You know, pretty soon they're going to have a doll that will do the kids' homework, right? And so, rarely do I ever hear as a pastor, rarely do I ever hear somebody say, man, I am content. I am content with all that I have. I am just content with my relationship with God and all that He's done for me. Psalm 23.1, the famous Psalm 23, starts out this way. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When I read that as a boy, I was so confused. If God is my shepherd, how come I don't want Him? You know, that's how I read it. But of course, that's not what it means. It means if God is your shepherd, you won't need anything else. You will be content. You will not want. Your, your heart will be satisfied. I ask you this morning, do you have everything that you need? Do you have enough? Are you satisfied in your soul with what God has provided for you? Or are you caught up in the world's mode of being unsatisfied, wanting more? So let me look at this. Paul says he's learned this secret of contentment wherever he was. And let's notice number one in, the first, in verse 10. He, he finds contentment with Christians. 
with other Christian friends, there is a contentment. Verse 10 says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. And Paul's talking about this Philippian church, these people that he loved, this church that he started. And what Paul is saying, we know when we get to the last verses, their offering did get there. They did send things to help Paul. Food, clothing, money that he needed. And Paul was saying, but I know you were so concerned for me, you couldn't get it to me fast enough. There was, there was no opportunity for you. You weren't able to get it to me. Maybe because of the Roman law. Maybe there was just no one that could travel that far. But for whatever reason, they couldn't get their gifts there fast enough. But what I see in this verse is Paul, even though he's in prison, and even though he doesn't have much, he found a contentment in the love of God's people. You know, there's something about being a part of a church where people really love you. They're really concerned about you. They'll really pray for you. We've seen that in our church. We've experienced that. Sometimes you don't experience it unless you go through a hard time. And some of the hard times, I, I've been the hardest times in my ministry have been the times when I've seen the love of God's people. And it can really help you to be content during those times. Um, having a, fa a loving family brings contentment. And I just want to say to you, if you're not a part of our family, we want you. And, and I will tell you, the church sometimes can be closer than your immediate family. And sometimes in our families, there's friction, and, and there's, there's not the love that there should be. But in the church of Jesus Christ, there is such a great love that can bring about contentment. So if you're not a content person, get involved with the church. Get around God's people. And it will begin to heal your heart with satisfaction and contentment. Number two, Paul found contentment with his circumstances. Verse 11, he says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Paul's just saying, listen, there have been times in my life when I had steak and lobster. But there's times in my life when I'm going hungry. He's obviously writing this from prison. There were times we read about in the New Testament where people gave a great offering to Paul. And there was other times when Paul had absolutely nothing. And we see in, in their times, he was often cold. And he was all, often suffering. And he felt a lot of persecution. And as we see in Paul's life, it's so far from this Christianity that says, come to Jesus and all your problems will go away. But even in the midst of his problems, what he is saying here, he's learned to be content. He's not saying he's tough in his own human willpower. He is saying, through my life, through the ups, through the downs, God, the Holy Spirit, has taught me to be content. It's... It's a, it's a beautiful thing to be satisfied. It's a beautiful thing to be content. God wants His people to be content. I think a lot of times we think the best Christian, the best Christian is the one doing so much. But you know what? Maybe it's the, 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 it's the best Christian that is just content. And I'm not talking about, you know, the kind of contentment where you wake up and the house is a mess. 
okay, the garage is a mess, and you don't want to go to work, and so you're just content to stay home and watch television. Okay. We're not talking about that. Not talking about that. We're talking about a contentment within that can only come from the Spirit of God where you are content in whatever your circumstance is. Proverbs says it this way, and I, I don't think it's Proverbs 39. <laughs> So that's my typo error. It says, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and, and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. The writer of the Proverbs there is saying, I want to stay balanced. I don't, want, I don't want to catch myself looking for riches. I don't want to be rich because if I'm rich and all my needs are met, then I'll say, who needs God? And this is why very rich and successful people, you don't see them in the church. Because who needs God when you've already got everything you think you've got? Of course, they don't have peace but they're trapped by their riches. And of course he says, but I don't want to be poor. He don't want to be poor. So then, he does, so then he'll steal, be tempted to steal. He says, I want to be balanced. In other words, I just want to be content with wherever I am in life. Whatever God has provided for me, I want to find this contentment. Paul learned to be content in whatever his circumstances were. Do you find yourself being content when circumstances are hard, when things aren't well at work, when things aren't well with your health, are you able to be content in God's love? It's so important for us to learn this and develop this in our life. And then number three, and finally, and this is the key, he found contentment with Christ. It was Christ that gave him this supernatural contentment in the midst of such a hard situation. Verse 13 says again, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Christ was His strength. The Spirit of God within Him is what gave Him strength. Hey, we all know those people in the world. Hey, they've been through so much, but they're tough. They're tough and they just, they got that personality. They keep on going but they don't experience the peace of God. They don't experience the God of peace. And so Paul, Paul is telling us as, as Christians that he wants us to have something beyond our own human strength. It's something that comes from the Spirit of God within us that strengthens us no matter what the situation. You read it all through the Bible. You look at the books of wisdom, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And you look at the wisdom of those books. You start, at, you start with Job and look at Job. Job lost everything. But he found his contentment in God, Jesus Christ, who is the God of the Old Testament. And then when you get to Solomon's life, you read about Solomon. Solomon had everything. He had everything there was. He was the richest man on earth. He had everything money could buy. But he says at the end of his book, I found that it was chasing after the wind. I had no contentment. The only thing that brought him contentment was what? To fear God and keep His commandments. Again, it's a relationship with God. That's what brings us to contentment. A lot of us, we think, we, we really think, if we win the lottery, that's going to bring us contentment. That's going to fix everything. But you know what? If you're not fixed in here, it won't. And you can research all the winners of the lottery and you see how their lives are destroyed. And they don't, and it, it doesn't give them what they think it's going to give them. 
So sometimes we're, we're looking for, they, they become idols, things that we think are going to give us happiness and contentment. And it's just not true. The only contentment you're going to find is when you fall in love with God and you realize how much God is in love with you and you grow in that relationship with Him, that's what's going to bring you true contentment. You know, what I've found studying the book of Philippians here, Paul would have made a lousy televangelist, wouldn't he? I mean, he was so never manipulating for money, wasn't talking about being healthy and wealthy and wise all the time. He would accept his circumstances where they were, and he kept his eyes on Christ. Now, I don't believe every TV preacher teaches or preaches lies. Okay, don't misunderstand me. But I am telling you that the preachers that teach what's called the prosperity gospel, okay, those are lies. And I know sometimes you wonder why I harp about that so much because I see people in my church that get caught up in that type of philosophy. What's the prosperity gospel? That God wants you wealthy. God wants you rich. That God wants you healthy. And if you are not healthy, it's because you don't have faith. And if you're not wealthy, it's because you don't have faith. See, they, they teach that it's your faith that's going to bring it about. So your God becomes your faith. My faith is nothing. My faith is only what my faith is into. The person I'm into. That's the only thing that makes my, what makes my faith good. It's in God. It's in Jesus Christ. So be very careful. Because you're gonna, you start thinking, you know, and some of you, you come to church thinking by coming to church, everything's going to go good now, right? God's going to make everything good for you. You're going to be healthy. God's going to answer every one of your prayers. All right? Some of you think, some of you think, if you pray and if you have faith, your team is going to win today. You really believe that? Now, I want, I want to tell you something. I want you to think about this with me. So all those people in that other big city that's praying for their team and has faith in their team and is praying to the same God you are for their team to win, what's wrong with their faith? What's wrong with their prayers? And see, you start to think, my prayers are better. My, my faith is better. Because my team, let, let me tell you something. You want to know what the Christian thing to do? The Christian thing would be to pray for your team to lose. Why? So your brother and sister will be blessed and you'll be miserable. That's the Christian thing to do. And, and I'm just telling you, you better be careful with all that. Because you start thinking it's about you and it's about your faith. And that's not what it's about. I know, I know that the Bible talks so much about that God wants to bless us. He does. That God is for us. That God is with us. We, we're talking about that in Philippians. But it doesn't mean that we can have everything our way in this life. Sometimes we're meant to go through hard times so we can bring about a Christian attitude. And what these, what these television guys and the prosperity movement, they know how to take the Bible and they know how to manipulate it. So, you know, they'll, they'll take the story of Abraham. Abraham was a wealthy guy. God told Abraham that through Abraham, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. So the TV guy reads that passage and then he says, see, Book of Romans says, we're children of Abraham. And since Abraham was wealthy, and since Abraham was blessed, all you got to do is have faith and claim it, and it'll come to you. 
but they don't teach the entire context of it. All the nations of the, of the world will be blessed through Abraham is, is, isn't talking anything about earthly wealth. It's talking about the person that would come through Abraham, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. It's about a Savior, not your health and wealth. Here's a verse these guys play games with. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And 2 Corinthians 8 is a money chapter. It's teaching about giving from your heart and, and being a generous, giving Christian. And Paul says this. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor so that you by His poverty might become rich. <laughs> there it is. God wants you to be rich. That is not talking about money. Christ became poor because Christ left heaven. He left all the riches of heaven. The, the, the second person in the Trinity left all of that left the glories of heaven and came and, and took on a human body. And He was poor when He walked the earth. And He had no place to lay His head, Jesus said. Think about that. If, if, if being good, if being Christian makes you rich, why wasn't Jesus rich? It, it, it's just a lie. It's a lie. And, and why are so many people, why are thousands, millions of people in, there's more churches like that out there than a Bible church like ours. How can these people be so gullible? Because their flesh wants it. There's something in our flesh that wants God to be about us. That, that, that there's something appealing to it to know that God's going to give me money if I need it and God's going to make me healthy if I need it. Instead of just coming to church and worshiping Him, being thankful that He came to give us salvation, that we don't deserve anything from Him. Hey, if you knew that God would never answer another one of your prayers, would you still come and worship Him? Would you come and worship Him for all that He's done, for Him leaving heaven to come so we could be rich? In other words, we could have salvation, not be rich in this life, but we'll be rich for all of eternity. And what happens is, sometimes the powerful thing that Jesus did in His first coming, people try to claim it now. And it's just not going to be claimed now. It's not, it's not happening till His second coming. Or until you die and you're, you're in His presence. Do you understand that? Yes, it's coming. And yes, you are going to be very healthy. Let me tell you, that day is coming. But it's not for the now. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm not trying to make you lose faith in your prayers. I promise you, if you get sick, if somebody gets cancer in this church, I'm going to pray that God heal you. If I get sick, I'm going to pray that God heals me. But I also got to know that it's, it, it's got to be what God decides. It's not my faith that's going to get it done. It's in a, if, it, if a good God chooses to heal us, it's because He's a good God. It's not necessarily because I had more faith. That, that is a false thing. Do not get caught up in that, brothers and sisters. Look at the Scriptures. Let me show you one more verse. We'll close this up. Isaiah 53, 5. Talking about our salvation. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds, we are healed. This is another verse. Those guys on TV take it, see? When Jesus died on the cross, you were healed. And the reason why 
you're sick is because you don't believe that verse. And you've got to claim that verse. That is not talking about physical healing. It's talking about spiritual healing. Yes, we are healed. Yes, we now, what he's saying is we now have peace with God. We're at war with God before we come to Christ in our sinful state. But again, Jesus came. And on that cross, he took the punishment we deserve. And that gives us peace with God. And that ought to be enough for us to come to church and worship. And yes, ultimately, because of what Christ did, we will be physically healed. We will get a new resurrected body. There is going to be a new earth. And it's going to be a glorious one. And the animals are going to be tame. And the lion will lie down next to the lamb. And we will live forever with our great king. But for the meantime, we have to learn to be content before, even before Jesus comes again or before he calls us home. In every circumstance, in every situation, God wants to give us contentment wherever you're at. I know some of you in here today, you're, you're going through some hard things. Um, <clears throat> you're facing some tests from the doctor. You're waiting for those tests to come back. Um, you're going through hard things in your marriage. You're going through hard things with your finances. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to somehow, instead of always pray that God take it away or that God change everything, somehow, in that circumstance, in that situation, you find a way to pray to God and get close to God and, and ask Him to give you contentment where you're at. In God's time, He's a good God. He, he will answer prayers. And let's don't ever stop believing that God, God answers our prayers. But let's also always cultivate an attitude of contentment in whatever situation we're in. You know, I said earlier, I guess the world's song would be, I can't get no satisfaction. But if there was a song that I would pick for these verses or for the book of Philippians, it would be a Christian song written by Horatio Spafford. Now, I've talked about him before, so some of you will know who he is. But everybody needs to know who he is because we'll be singing that song again coming up in the next couple of weeks or so. That song will be sung, which is called, It Is Well With My Soul. It is well with my soul. What a beautiful song, isn't it? Written by Horatio Spafford. A lot of you don't know, though, about that song, It Is Well. Horatio Spafford, his four-year-old little boy, his four-year-old little boy died from scarlet fever back in the 1800s. He lost a little boy, this Christian man who loved God. Just, just some time after that, his four daughters from the ages 11 to 2 was in a ship accident and, and they drowned. His four daughters, he's lost his son, his four daughters, his wife sent back word, his wife sent back word, survived alone, survived alone. He got those words. His wife, precious wife survived, but God took his daughters and his son to heaven. So the next time we sing, it is well with my soul, you remember what that song is about. And he's not saying it is well with my soul because God's about to give me some new cars and some new clothes and he's about to make me healthy and happy. No, he sang that song in the midst of great pain. Great pain. So may we learn that. May we learn that we can sing that song. We can say the words, it is well with my soul because I am content in my Savior and my God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.